will start. We're going to rearrange the agenda just a little bit because of where we need quorum. We have a quorum to start the meeting, um, but we don't have two-thirds quorum to deal with the bylaws. So with your um, indulgence, we are going to switch the agenda around a little bit. But first is the welcome. So welcome, um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is our second um, board meeting since the open meeting law, and we're delighted to have you all. Uh, we were going to um, approve the minutes, I hope, from the other um, meeting. We're then going to move to the 990. We'll then move to the bylaws, and then, then we'll go back to the presentation of the slate of nominations for the board of directors. Um, the reason we're changing that is that it's a little hard for new people who are just joining to approve um, the 990 from last year and the uh, the new bylaws given that they've just seen them um, in the last uh, few days. So if that works for the board, um, I think that's what we'll do. So if I could um, ask if someone would move the minutes um, that were in your package. Thank you. And Amy, where is Amy? Amy, <laughs> could you call the roll, please? Yes, for vote to approve the October 2nd, 2012 annual meeting minutes. Clinton Bench, James Chan, Cheryl Cronin, Chris Finchin. Aye. Bob Four, Bill Griffiths. Yes. Maggie Hunt. Yes. Suzanne LaVoy. Yes. Woody Lynn. Yes. Chris Manfredi. Yes. Roger Murray. Yes. Young Carr. Helen Thank you. So, oh, and here we have Young Park. Young, would you like to approve the minutes? Of, of, okay. <laughs> Young Park says yes. Great. Um, so, okay. So I think if it's okay, if it's not going to cause a breakdown of our of our presentation, I think we're just going. To, you're not doing a. a I am not. Okay. Great. So, if I could turn this over to Chris Manfredi um, to do the approval of the 990s. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, the 990s, the 60 plus pages, uh, were sent around to the board. Um, and um, it's not as easy to talk about highlights of a 990 and the form <laughs> FC as it might have been from the financial statements. But I first want to thank Lisa Schimmel for her wonderful work. And uh, Feely and Driscoll also were very helpful in the preparation of that, so um, we're feeling very good about it. Um, I, I'm welcome to take any questions that people have. There's, it's a very standard report. It, um, there's a reconciliation in it that reconciles the numbers there to the financial statements. Um, there's, you know, 10 plus pages that talk about in Schedule O that talk about the mission and the organization. So there's a lot of good information in there. We uh, are pretty pleased that it has so much transparency in it, and so I open it up for any questions. Are any of the other board members? Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, um, shall we have someone move the... Uh, second? So the minutes have been approved. Thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to um, the bylaws because we now have a quorum, um, a two-thirds quorum, so that we can do that. Um, and we've been really fortunate in having with us um, two lawyers from Goldstein and Stores. You all know Peter Pohansky. He's been with us through the bid, through Occupy Boston, through um, all sorts of issues for the Greenway, and his leadership has been phenomenal on all that. Um, so we thank Peter for that, and he has now um, agreed to take a look at the bylaws with us, because the bylaws um, needed work based on the legislation that was passed in July, 
and based on issues that have come up over a period of time when you have bylaws in place. Um, so we wanted to get them in place. From them will flow um, other documents that we'll work on over the winter. But we wanted to make sure that everyone agreed with the bylaws before we did the other documents. So I'm going to, I think Jack is, okay, we, we've enlisted Jack Iverman from Goldstone Stores to be the person who is the one with all the experience with nonprofits and with bylaws, and it's just been a pleasure to work with Jack and have that kind of gravitas and knowing what goes on and also a lot of fun to work with. So Jack, thank you. Well, thanks. Um, when I have uh, problems with Peter, I occupy his office. So it's a good relationship. So the bylaws that um, we've prepared, the revised bylaws, are at the 30,000 foot level, pretty similar to bylaws I'm sure all or many of you are familiar with from other nonprofit organizations that you've been involved with. However, um, at the 10,000 foot level, there are a lot of variations. And so I'm going to spend about five or 10 minutes quickly going through the bylaws and highlighting what I think are the sort of the notable variations or exceptions to um, these bylaws relative to other bylaws that you might be familiar with. But it is very much the case that the devil is in the details. So um, I'll try not to get into commas and semicolons and that sort of thing, but uh, focus on the larger ways in which these bylaws differ from uh, some of the more standard ones. The, um, and if you have the um, draft bylaws, I'll be sort of flipping through them a page at a time. And I'll try to refer to section numbers if um, that's particularly notable. Um, section 1.1 is a restatement, essentially, of your charter. And it sets forth in a striking degree of detail the, um, the purposes of the organization and its powers. And on the very first page, the organization has in its bylaws the um, uh, power to enter into a lease with the Department of Transportation. That's real unusual. You never see that in most bylaws. Um, the power to adopt rules and regulations governing the operation of the Greenway, the power to um, receive and accept contributions, obviously a core principle of, uh, of the conservancy, and um, <coughs> to um, make annual statements of goals and objectives. This is, I would say, in the scheme of things, a fairly unusual set of provisions. That said, not particularly um, dramatic if one has some basic familiarity with the goals and purposes of the conservancy. The um, specified powers in section 1.2 are substantially a very boring repetition of what we just spoke about. Um, the balance of the uh, provisions on, um, in Article 1 are sort of housekeeping provisions. In Massachusetts, nonprofit corporations can be structured in one of two ways. One is a method where there are members, and the members elect the directors, and the directors make all the decisions. The other model, and this is the model that the Conservancy has, is not to have any members and instead have a board of directors that is in some respects self-perpetuating. So they elect themselves or their successors. Your case is a little bit different because you have lots of uh, different organizations nominating directors. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But so this is a non-membership organization. Uh, examples of membership organizations might be um, know, the Audubon Society or something like that where you pay dues you get invited to a dinner once a year, it's not a very good dinner usually, and you get, in particular, the power to elect the directors. And that's really, as a legal matter, the only thing that is typically done. So that's not your form. Your form is a self-perpetuating board. Please. Uh, I paid $60 and I got a letter saying, thank you for your membership gift of $60. Yeah, I, I think the, the term mem terminology is something we all get hung up on. Um, there is a provision in these bylaws that indeed authorizes the corporation to have things called members, but for purposes of Chapter 180, which is the Massachusetts statute, 
those people who are quote unquote members are not members within the meaning of the statute. So the term, for example, um, if I want to um, make a contribution to um, some social welfare organization, they thank me for my membership check, that doesn't make me a member. Um, it means I'm a supporter, and I think probably, I haven't seen the letter, but probably in the context of that letter, the term member was meant as a supporter, someone who's on the mailing list, someone who's invited to meetings, but that does not convert into statutory powers under Chapter 180. And I would say most organizations, most Massachusetts nonprofit organizations that are director only also have a category called members, but it's not statutory members. Okay. Article 2 um, is an important article, and it's one that um, sets up the board of directors. And the provisions of section 2.2 go into, I would say, the most detail I have ever seen about the composition of the board. And it's fabulous, and it's probably the reason why there are so many um, people participating in this organization. A lot of people really care. And I don't need to go through the list of the, what do you decide? A dozen, yeah, 21 different seats that are there. And the seats are um, filled, are nominated, not elected. So for example, taking the first example, the governor's appointment in Clause C, is um, there are two directors who are selected by the board from a list of names provided by the governor. So sort of an important detail, the governor does not appoint people to the board. The governor nominates people, and then the board has to make a decision to elect one or two, or I guess supposedly, um, theoretically anyway, the board could say, sorry, no, you have to nominate some more names. So there is a, it's a detail. Um, it's likely not going to be a power that's not going to be exercised frequently. But merely because an organization has nominated someone, that does not automatically convert to that individual being on the board. This board must take an affirmative act to elect that individual. And that's, that is the case for all the nominees. I selected the governor just because that's the first one. Yes? And, and is one, one name constitute a list, or does a list have a different name? One name can constitute a list. Okay. Uh, and some of the nominees are, there are two seats. Um, most of them, I think, are one seat. And the term lengths vary. Um, some are three years, some are one year, some are I think, five years. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's, I, mean, I think, just a fabulous representation from all sorts of constituencies. I'm going to step outside of the bylaws for just a minute. Um, and I think it's, um, this is probably the appropriate point. The individuals who are nominated by the governor or the secretary of energy and transportation or the wharf district council or any one of the other organizations sit on this board and by virtue of sitting on this board those individuals have a fiduciary obligation to the conservancy period they are not sitting on this board as delegates of the council or delegates of the governor. They are obligated as a legal matter to act in the best interests of the conservancy. Sometimes there will be conflicts, um, and in that, it's not unusual, it's not terrible, it sort of happens. People then need to recuse themselves. Recuse is a fancy way of saying excuse. You leave the room and you walk out. And you don't vote, you don't lobby on the, on the matter. But Many times when people are selected by the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council appointment, they feel an obligation to act in the best interests of those individuals. And there is some significant truth to that, but the overlay is they do so in the context of acting in the best interests of the conservancy. They are not delegates who vote merely as director. They have an independent obligation to act in the best interest of the conservancy. That's pretty abstract, um, 
and it's hard, when you have specific examples, if Peter or Cole will help you figure it out, but as sort of an overarching matter, the obligation is to act in the best interest of the conservancy. There are um, uh, A through J uh, people who are um, appointed or are nominated excuse me, to uh, fill particular seats, and then there are seven directors who are elected on an at-large basis, and that's in uh, section 2.2, clause N. And there's, I'm sure, a lot of politics there, and a lot of balancing, a lot of thought and structuring that goes into it, but when sitting on the board, everyone is the director, period, paragraph. Not a North End or a Chinatown director, you're a director. Not an at-large director, you're a director. The chair of the board is um, selected at the annual meeting. Uh, similarly, the vice chair. We have a somewhat um, unusual way of calculating term limits. And most of the directors are subject to a term limit. And the term limits are typically, let's say, for example, two terms each of three years. So we needed to come up with a structure for deciding so when do those three years start exactly? And the, the answer that these bylaws contain is that if you're elected at the annual meeting, then your three-year term starts at the annual meeting and continues for three years thereafter. Nothing particularly obvious, unusual. However, given the likelihood that people are going to be coming onto the board as a result of nominations by public officials, neighborhood organizations, the likelihood that everyone is going to be nominated in time for the annual meeting is non-existent. It's just not going to happen. They're, they're going to dribble in over the course of the year. If it doesn't, then this one will be wasted. I don't think it will be wasted. So what we said is that when someone is elected as a director midterm, that is sometime subsequent to the annual meeting, that first chunk of time until the next annual meeting is free. It doesn't count for purposes of the three-year term. So let's assume, this is not correct, but let's assume that your annual meeting is January and someone is elected in February and they have a three-year term limit. In fact, that individual is going to serve for 11 months and another three years. So that's the rule we came up with. I should say any of these rules that we've come up with, um, you're free to change. Um, we did our best job. I doubt we got it perfect. And so at the end of any meeting, there's a process for changing the bylaws. You need a two-thirds vote of all directors then in office to change the rules. You can change them. I would suggest as a matter of good practice, it's not the kind of thing you want to do at every meeting or every other meeting. Um, it's something you might want to do once every year or two, um, maybe more frequently as you're sort of getting up to speed and facing challenges, and um, then we'll drift off and won't be quite as frequent. There are provisions here for meetings, special meetings, annual meetings, open meetings. <clears throat> the um, bylaws permit um, individuals to participate in meetings by telephone to the extent the open meeting law recognizes that as, uh, as a proper way of functioning. Um, the question comes up from time to time, can directors vote by proxy? Massachusetts law is real clear. No, directors may not vote by proxy. Directors have to be present, either physically or to the extent the open meeting law permits it um, by, uh, by telephone. There's provision here for a uh, unanimous for action by written consent, whereby all the directors sign a piece of paper, that ain't going to happen. There's too many of you. <laughs> it's not, someone's going to be away or indisposed, but we have it here just on the off chance of my work. The next section, Article 3, deals with committees. And those are committees of the board. Um, the board is free to establish committees whenever the board decides to do so. And I would say, Almost all actions of the board can be taken 
when a quorum is present and a majority of the quorum approves the action. That's sort of the default rule. There are a few variations, but that's generally speaking the, um, the way in which the board takes action. So one of the ways, one of the things the board can do is establish committees. There are three committees, however, that the board does not have the discretion not to establish. I think I said that the right There must be a audit risk management and finance committee, there must be a development committee, and there must be an investment committee. You don't need a statute, must no, no, no. By the bylaws, right. But at any moment, we could determine that that kind of committee is necessary or useful anymore. Not exactly. Um, as to the three committees I went through, yeah. audit risk management, investment, and uh, development, yeah. the board, to change that, has to change its bylaws. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Actually, that was I was asking. Um, okay. So yeah, this, is, this is a, um, it's a, it's a good question because it's an example of the board imposing upon itself a discipline or a degree of rigor as to how it wants to conduct its activities. It is true the board can change those rules, but there's a little bit of process. You have to change the bylaws. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. all of us have actually, I mean, we're, we're all very experienced board members, so I actually just wanted to ask you kind of a basic question. Do you think that you I leave that to my partner, Peter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we trust you and yeah. we're going to rely on your position on that. No, they, they, they sure are. I mean, there are things that the statute doesn't tell us um, that need to be in the bylaws, and, and we've made some decisions on what to propose, but absolutely. And, and uh, you know, the main reason for addressing and revising the bylaws at this point is to bring them into compliance with the statute, both in the composition of the board and compliance with the open meeting law and public records law. So many of these changes flow from things that the statute tells us now have to be included. Does that make sense? Excellent. Thank you. I, and that's, so, so we really do need to understand that, you know, they, they, they've been, to some extent, vetted with a whole lot of people beyond Peter and, and Jack, but they, but there are bylaws. So if anybody has any questions or wants to see any changes on the board, um, we should talk about it. I have about another 30 seconds. Uh, even though there are a lot of lot more pages, the <laughs> last chunk of pages go pretty quickly. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, the default rule is you need a quorum, and the board acts by a majority of the quorum. Article uh, 5 speaks about officers and directors. That's pretty standard. You have a um, president, treasurer, and clerk. You have a um, provision for an executive director. Um, and there's a specific acknowledgement in the bylaws that the records of the conservancy are public records. And the balance of the bylaws up until Article 10 are totally boring. If you want to talk with me about it, I'd be glad to discuss it, but it's too early to put you to sleep. Article 10 speaks about amendments, and that's sort of an important provision, and it's the rules as to how you're going to change the rules. And I said generally you need a quorum and a majority of quorum to take most actions, subject to a couple of exceptions. This is one of the, this is the most important exception. And this exception says that you need a vote of two-thirds of all directors that are in office to change these rules to amend the policy. That's it. Um, so Does anybody have any, on the board have anybody questions for Jeff? Yes, Chris. I, I do. Um, I noticed the section, and I think it's uh, on page 13, where it refers to a president, which yes. means redundant, or, um, and I don't know if we've had, had one before, but would it be possible where you talk about chair to have those positions be the same? Or when you talk about president, <coughs> say that for, for purposes of these bylaws, the chair will be. We certainly could do that. Massachusetts law requires that there be someone who has the responsibilities of president. You can call that person whatever you want. Um, 
chief cook and bottle washer, I haven't seen, but that would be a legitimate term. You could also call that person chair. But if you do that, you're going to be, it may work internally, but whenever you deal with outside organizations, they're used to, and the state is certainly used to having every corporation have a president. So what I suspect you would wind up doing is having Mary Smith, chair, and president. That, that, so that's, that's, that's you're that's sort of back where you started from. Uh, there happens to be uh, 2.3 sentences that the chair shall also serve as president of the corporation. That's what I was looking for, and thank you for... Um, Thanks. 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 Th
requires a different study. Uh, I would say the most, certainly the most common uh, parliamentary authority is Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, we can sometimes put that in bylaws, we certainly can. Uh, we try not to recommend it because it should be preceded by some thought and some familiarity. We can't even think as a matter of good governance. It would be great if some committee of the board studied it, recommended it to the board, and the board were to adopt it. Thank you. Okay. Um, if if anyone wants to work on that in terms of, I mean, I, I sort of I sort of loosely do. It's not really Robert's rules, but we make sure that something's you know forwarded, seconded, and then we vote. But if some if anyone feels that they want to have something that's more rigorous than that. Just let me know, and you know, as long as you want to do the work, <laughs> that's fine. With me. No, I'm kidding. We'll, we'll be happy to assist. If you decide to do that, you should also take a look at another parliamentary authority, Sturgis, which is much more user friendly and um, is much more um, practical. Than okay. Okay. Is there? Any, thanks. Then. Are there any? Are we good? Okay. Um, are there any other? Questions, issues, anybody wants to raise? Okay, I don't know if it's Robert's rules, but may I have a motion to approve the new bylaws, please? here he would have voted yes too but bob happens no to be proxies. In, no proxies but just so you'll know bob sends his regrets but he's um, out of the country right now so he that's why he's not here um so thank you this was a lot of work on the part of a lot of people um and uh we really appreciate it so uh peter and jack thank you you're welcome to stay but you're also um feel free to leave if you'd like um, but Okay, I knew, I knew you thought you did. Okay, thanks, Jack. We really appreciate it. Um, so now I'm going to move back to the um, presentation of the slate of nominations to the Board of Directors. We're really delighted um, that the process is moving forward and that we have three more um, people to come to the Board for nomination. Um, we have... Where is Chris? We have, <laughs> to my right, um, next to um, Chris Manfredi. We have Chris Becky. Yeah, um, he's a partner at um, the firm of Coughlin Becky. Um, he is a resident of the Leather District and has been for some time. He has been very involved with the Leather District Neighborhood Association. Um, we are delighted that his name came forward, and I know you all have his bio, um, and so he he will be up for approval. We also have John Pregman, um, who is to my left. Um, John is also an attorney. Um, at KJC Law Firm, um, where he works in litigation of personal injury and employment and consumer protection matters. Um, John is a resident of the North End and um, walks to work right through the Greenway every day um, and is very interested in helping us out in any way he can. So we're delighted that, that John's name was put forth. And Jane Pavilardo. Oh, she had to leave. oh she Jane had to just leave. left. Um, so I knew I knew we were running tight. I thought I thought we might make it. Um, but Jane um, is from the Wharf District. We're delighted that her name is put forward too. She is a resident of Rose Wharf, and um, she is she holds a degree from the music of mu in music from Boston University, and is involved with Beth, Beth Israel Deaconess, 
Um, she serves as a trustee of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and she's very involved in the philanthropic community in Boston. So again, um, we're delighted that Jane's name was put forward. Um, so do any of the board have any discussions or any of the potential new board members want to say anything? Um, not that you have to, this isn't a speechy kind of thing. I just wanted to uh, see if you wanted to. Great. Uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the residents of Water District, we're excited about the opportunity to participate in this. Um, taking what I guess it's in Jack, the attorney. Yes. What Jack was saying earlier about um, having an obligation to the board, not just to a neighborhood, that I take seriously. I'm sure uh, the other uh, members who are uh, quote unquote resident members uh, feel the same way. I know from speaking with some of them that they do. And that certainly we believe Thank you, Chris. Um, anyone else? Great. So I put forth that um, nomination slate as chair um, and ask that it be seconded. Um, can we have a roll call? In? A vote to approve the nomination slate for new board members for the Greenway. Clinton Bench? Aye. James Chan? Yes. Cheryl Cronin? Yes. Chris Finchin? Yes. Bob Gore? Bill Griffiths? Yes. Maggie Hunt? Yes. Suzanne LaVoy? Yes. yes. Woody Lynn? Yes. Chris <coughs> Manfredi? Yes. Georgia Murray? Yes. Young Park? Yes. And Helen Chinchley? Yes. Thank you. Um, and really welcome. We, we decided to move that um, to that position because we didn't, we, we, although I know you've all read the board package, um, hard to approve the bylaws and the dynamics when you're, when you're new to the, to the organization. But we really do welcome you and um, we're thrilled um, with the neighborhood groups that have set forth, set forth people. Just so the board knows, we have um, several nominations yet to go. Um, one from Chinatown, one from North End, and two from the governor and one from the mayor. So we're still five members down, uh, but we're working on it. We're making progress every month. Um, and so we really look forward to getting to a full board, maybe not January, but hopefully um, by the spring sometime. And the only thing that I didn't say that I should is that in your package it said they would um, serve till 2015, um, because that's three years from 2012, but the bylaws we just that they really served the annual meeting in 2016. Um, this has been a very fluid thing that we've worked on the bylaws, so something to get rid of that some ways, but they are approved to 2016. And I'm 